We are happy to welcome on the stage uh, Harold Rain Gruber and Fred Marcos, Marcos, sorry, that will talk uh, us about get the ball, the best of both worlds, integrating Rust with other languages. Thank you. Hello RustLab and welcome to our talk, Get the both, Best of Both Worlds, How to Integrate Rust with Other Languages. Our talk will be structured in three parts. So first we will talk about how to use a Rust library from C and C++, then how to use a Rust library also from Java, and in the end there will be a short live demo comparing different image processing algorithms. My name is Harold Reingruber. I'm a software crafter and 3D graphics engineer at Daedalus Healthcare. I'm a hacking fan and also organizer of the mob programming on open source software meetup together with Fred and other awesome co-organizers. You can reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, my direct messages are open. Feel free to scan the QR code if you want. Hello. I'm Fred. Um, I am a software engineer. I work on PowerDNS at Open Exchange. Um, I co-organize the Rustic Mob Programming Meetup, where we do mob programming using Rust. Uh, I love scuba diving, and you can find me on my website and on GitHub. All right, so I'll be talking about using a Rust library from C and C++. Uh, so why would you want to do that? Um, perhaps you're developing an application uh, where you want the core logic to be in a performant memory safe language uh, and you want the to build the UI in GTK and C or, or Qt and C++. Or perhaps you are you have a legacy code base in, that is in C or C++ and you want to modernize it, maybe one module at a time or something like that. Um, the, um, the use case I'll be using is a priority queue. It's backed by the uh, Rust standard libraries binary heap. Um, the reason I use the name priority queue is to just not confuse between the binary heap and the memory heap. Um, basically, how it works is that we push elements out of order, and when we pop them out, they come out in order. Uh, we will be writing a foreign function interface around our um, uh, priority queue implementation. OK, so let's take a look at how we might use that from C. Um, we build an array and with a bunch of elements, and then we call the, the queues constructor, and we pass it a uh, pointer to that array and then the number of elements in that array. And this is pretty standard uh, C coding style. Uh, we check if the returned queue object is null, and if so, then we fail in some way. At the end of the block, we free the queue object, and in the middle, we loop a bunch of times, and um, we pop stuff from the queue. And this returns a struct with two members. The first member is the value that we may have popped. And the second one is a status code. The status code is an enum that could be a success, empty, or invalid argument. Uh, we switch over the status code. And if it's success, then uh, the value uh, in the struct is something valid, is something useful. So we print that out. If we get back an empty status code, then the, the queue is empty. And we just print nothing. And then if we got invalid argument, then maybe we passed uh, a null pointer as the queue object to the pop function, and so we fail in some way. Um, if we try to run that, uh, we see that the elements are popped in order, and then we get a bunch of nothings printed out. And this is because we try to pop uh, more times than we have elements in the queue. OK. Um, this is, um, Quickly, this is a header file of how uh, our queue API might look like for C. Um, the main point here is that the, uh, the struct PQ is an opaque type, so we don't really have access to the implementation details. Uh, those details are on the Rust side. Before we continue, um, we have to clarify a few things. Uh, the first point is that Rust guarantees don't hold across language boundaries. Uh, Rust by default mangles function names, and so we can use uh, we can mark functions with no mangle to disable that. Um, Rust does not follow the C or the platform calling convention, and we can mark functions with extern C or extern system to get that. 
uh, some Rust types are not FFI safe. So things like slices and tagged enums uh, cannot be shared across boundaries by value. Uh, structs and enums with the Rust representation don't have a specified layout. And so we can mark uh, them with wrapper C to get a C-like la layout. All right, let's take a look at the constructor. This is the C signature that we've seen earlier in the header file. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, Q object, and it's backed by the binary heap, like I mentioned before. Sorry, the Q struct, not the object. Um, and this is the signature of the constructor in uh, on the Rust side. So we see that we take elements as an option reference and the length, which I've mentioned before. We pass them separately. Um, and the surprise, something might be surprising here, and is that the elements reference is passed. Uh, to the Rust function as an option reference. And this works because of the nullable pointer optimization, meaning that since uh, the reference cannot be null, the compiler is able to take advantage of that and represent null using the options none or represent the op an option none to, or use an option none to represent null. Um, and uh, this is more general than just for references. So. Um, it's for non-nullable types and non-zeroable types. Um, the return type of the function uh, might also be surprising. So the idea here is a box of a size type is guaranteed to be a reference. And so an option of a box of a size type is also guaranteed to be similar to a pointer. In that sense, again, an option none would be returned as a null. The implementation is trivial. We create the queue. And at the end of the block, we box it up onto the heap and return it. And then we extract the, an, a reference to the elements array. Um, and basically, the question mark here simply shortcuts the function. If the elements is none, then the function returns none. Um, and if there's something in there, it's extracted into the reference. And then out of that reference and the len argument, we create um, a slice. And using the standard libraries from raw parts function, this is unsafe because the Rust compiler cannot really guarantee um, that the len argument we passed is correct and give the, in the sense that the number of elements behind that array is the right, um, is equal to len here. After that, we simply loop over the elements and we push them one by one into the queue. Uh, we mark the function with x turn c and with no mangle, as I've said, as, as I've mentioned before. All right, um, let's take a look at the pop function before we do that. Um, yeah, those are the. This is the the return value and the status code that I've mentioned earlier. It's the difference is that they're just implemented in Rust, and they're marked with wrapper c to get a c-like representation. And then the implementation of the pop. Uh, method or function um, is pretty trivial. We simply check whether we got a none or a null pointer, and if that's the case, then we return invalid argument. Uh, if not, then we uh, call pop on the internal binary heap, and uh, we return success if we popped something with the value that we that we popped, and if not, then we simply return empty and some dummy value. Um, the push function is pretty trivial. There's nothing really special here to see just for completeness. Uh, and then the free function uh, takes the Q object by ownership. And so when it's passed in here, um, it will get deallocated at the end of the block automatically. And so we don't really need, it will be dropped, so we don't really need any implementation there. Um, the thing to note here is that it's passed as an option box. And so that means that if we, if, if an option none is passed here, uh, then nothing will be deallocated, meaning that we don't try to deallocate a null pointer. So, yeah. And if we try to build and run this uh, inside of Valgrind, we see that, I mean, it works, and also that there are no invalid um, memory accesses and no memory leaks. Okay, um, let's take a look at CBindGen. I mentioned this header file earlier for our uh, C API for the queue. And uh, that header file was written by hand. And we can avoid that using CBindGen. Uh, so CBindGen can automatically generate a header file for us by scanning uh, the Rust code and uh, producing a C header file out of that. 
uh, and it does that at build time. And um, it's just, it just needs a build script for that. So I'll quickly go over the build script. There's really nothing special. Uh, we look up the top level dire of our crate. Uh, we create a config. I just wanted to enable prefix with name here so that the enum variants are prefixed with the enum types name uh, in the header file. Um, then we create a conf another option is use size is size t. And basically, this asks C bind gen to represent um, um, to represent u size as size t instead of as a uh, um, as an int ptr. Um, so Harald, it's not completely related, but kind of orthogonal. And Harald will talk about strict provenance later. Um, yeah, we simply pass the enum config to the general config. We create the builder. Uh, we ask it that we want a C language header file. Um, and then we generate that header file into a directory under our crate top level c slash pq.h. And then we simply ask Cargo to rerun that build script every time our libRS file changes. Um, yeah, and if we look at the generated header file, uh, then it's pretty much the same as, we, as the one uh, that was handwritten. And the uh, Q-type is opaque. OK. Now we'll move on to C++. You, so we will create uh, C++ bindings using the CXX crate. And um, what is special about uh, CXX crate is that we don't have to maintain, um, to manually maintain this kind of Rust FFI and um, C side of things in the sense that you don't really have to manually create a Rust FFI and then create a C API out of that and then wrap that uh, in a C++ API, uh, or like in a C++ idiomatic API. And so um, CXX allows us to just like cross that boundary automatically. Um, it does that, uh, it pretty much does that by implementing um, Rust types in C++ and vice versa. Um, it supports integration with build systems like CMake, but it also supports uh, rudimentary, um, like, like raw compiler builds and stuff like that. Um, yeah, this is what we need in our cargo tumble. It's not really important. Uh, and we need also a build script for that, but it's not really important. Um, so let's look at how we might use um, our queue from C++. So we create a Rust box. So this is C++ code. We create a Rust box uh, and we call the constructor and we pass it elements. And elements is a Rust slice. And that Rust slice is backed by a standard C++ array. And then we loop a few times and we pop stuff from the queue and we print the values that we pop. Um, to handle errors, we can use exceptions, and so we just print out the exception message whenever, an, uh, whenever we get one, yeah. Um, so how does the Rust side of the code look like? So we need a few declarations, and these declarations go into a submodule um, called FFI in that case, and uh, it's marked with the CXX bridge macro, and this macro is what takes care of some of the magic of CXX. Um, inside of that um, mod block, we have an external Rust block. Um, and outside, uh, we can also have an external C++ block. So outside of these extern blocks are shared structures between C and C++, meaning both of them have access to the implementation details. Um, and inside uh, these extern blocks, uh, so for in the case of extern Rust, these are declarations where like the source of implementation is Rust, um, and vice versa for uh, the extern C++ block. All right, so we declare our Q type. Uh, we declare the constructor for it. This has to be a freestanding function. Um, and notice that it just takes a slice rather than the two separate uh, parameters uh, like we did for the C bindings. And then there is the pop method. Um, and the pop method returns a result. And the error type here is implicit only in the declaration. And any type that implements the display trait can be used here. Um, yeah, I also skip over push because it's really nothing interesting compared to pop. So let's look at the implementation. Um, so that's the definition of our queue uh, struct. Nothing new here. Um, the implementation of the constructor is pretty idiomatic Rust. Uh, we're using a slice, and um, we don't have to use unsafe like we did for the C bindings. 
Um, and then for the pop implementation, um, here we have the error type of the return uh, of the resulting of the result. Um, we have the error type explicitly mentioned here, so I picked um, a static a static string for simplicity. Um, and the implementation is pretty idiomatic Rust as well compared to the C implementation, uh, the, compared to the implementation uh, of the C bindings. And so we try to pop from the queue. And if we could pop something, we return it as an okay. And if not, we return the message queue is empty as an error. Okay, the build script is also nothing special, but essentially what I'm doing here is simply asking CXX to like run the C++ compiler for me. So it won't only build my Rust code, but it will also uh, build my C++ code and link with the Rust, uh, like with the Rust side of things. Um, yeah, we can run that build and run it in Valgrind and we also see that there are no invalid memory accesses and there are no um, um, memory leaks. All right, so as a conclusion, essentially use no mangle and extern C if you're manually doing uh, C bindings. Um, think about types that can or cannot be shared uh, across the language boundaries. Um, use high level Rust constructs to represent lower level C constructs. Uh, they're more like option reference and option box of a size type uh, versus using raw pointers. They're more um, idiomatic and ergonomic, and they are probably a bit safer to use as well. And yeah, automate whatever you can. So evaluate whether C bind gen could be useful to you. And if you're doing C++, then think about CXX, really. Thank you very much. And this is a link to the repository, which contains the code and the presentation slide. Okay, now <clears throat> let's have a look how to do the same thing in Java. So I will talk about why it is interesting to access Rust from Java. Um, I will show also the priority queue example, first the Java part, later the Rust part. And I will demonstrate a couple of caveats if you're using Rust uh, Java with native code. And in the end, I will give a short summary of the most important things you should remember of our talk. Okay, so why is it interesting to use Rust with Java? So you, you can have the advantages of the managed world with the performance and power of the native world, or you might want to access low-level uh, device drivers or low-level APIs like OpenGL or Vulkan. And yeah, also for integrating with existing applications as often it's not feasible to rewrite everything in Rust. So in Java, there is the Java native interface, also called JNI. Uh, we can use it to access the priority queue. And one way to start with uh, would be to declare native methods in Java. For example, we create a Rusty priority queue class. Um, we declare a method. It's kind of like declaring an interface method in Java. The only special thing is you prefix it with the native keyword, and then Java knows it will uh, the the function is provided by some um, native library. We can call this function from our constructor, and yeah, native methods are actually just functions, so they they don't have access to any persistent object state on the native side. A workaround would can be accomplished by um, returning the native pointer on the Java side, and we can store this as a long member, for example. So this is when we then implement the push method, we have to make sure to pass this object pointer uh, to the native side next to the element we want to push onto the queue. Um, yeah. So the, the actual method um, basically delegates everything um, to, the uh, to Rust and also passes the object pointer. Very similar is the, the pop implementation, but this time we receive um, the element back and forward it as a return value. Um, what is a little bit more interesting is the, how to implement the free function. 
Um, so we also have to pass the object pointer and we can, for example, uh, define a method called destroy, uh, which calls the free function on, on the Rust side. Another idea could be um, implementing a finalizer, but uh, this is actually not recommended because it's not guaranteed to work in, uh, in all situations. We should make sure to invalidate our native pointer afterwards, um, for example, setting it to zero. Um, and if we do that, actually, in all the other methods where we access the pointer, we should insert a, a check before if, if we already if the pointer is already invalid. And if it is, we can, for example, throw an Ill illegal state exception. Okay, let's move on to the Rust side. So we need to provide um, the matching uh, function signature uh, that Java is expecting. Uh, you can either look up the, how it, the name mangling has to be done in the GNI specification, or maybe nicer approach is to generate the header file. The Java compiler, Java C, has a minus H flag, which does that. And if we look at the generated header file of our example, this is, for example, how the new function looks like. You can see it encodes the package name, the class name, and the function name all into the name of our function prototype. And it also passes some default parameters like the JNI environment, um, uh, the Java class, and also the J byte array, which is our parame parameter. Um, these types are declared in the JNI header file. We cannot use this header file uh, on the Rust side, but there is a crate called JNI, which provides all the types and log logic which we need to do that. So we add the JNI crate to our dependencies in the cargo toml, and then we can have a look how to implement our um, new function. So, yeah. It looks quite similar as the generated C header. Um, we have also the J environment and the J class as a parameter. The J class we don't actually need to use, so we can prefix it with an underscore. But yeah, we should also prefix it with um, external system and no mangle to make sure to have the calling convention Java is expecting. But a function name, it's pretty ugly, huh? Um, there is also another nice crate, GNI, JNIFN, which uh, helps us to improve that situation. If we add this one also to our dependencies, <coughs> it provides us with a macro called JNIFN, which takes the package name and the class name as a parameter, and then it allows us to declare the function with a human readable name, I would say. <coughs> Let's have a look at the actual implementation. We need to fetch the array from the Java side. Uh, we can do that with the environment.getByteArray elements. Um, it returns us an auto array type, which makes sure to free up the resources um, when it goes out of scope. We can create a slice from that um, using the pointer and the size of our Java array. And then we can just iterate over the slide, slice and push every element onto our uh, priority queue implementation. In the end, we have to convert our reference. Um, we need to move the priority queue to the heap with box new and then call box into raw to tell Rust that this me memory is now managed externally, so it doesn't clean up the memory uh, when the function goes out of scope. And we need to cast it to a JLong, which is actually a 64-byte integer, so that yeah, it matches the Java type, basically. There are two approaches how to fetch an array from the Java side. So instead of get array, 
get byte array elements, there is also get primitive array critical. The difference is it should not copy the array, um, but it might block uh, garbage collection on the Java side until the, the auto primitive array returned is destroyed. I said should and might because it actually depends on the JVM you're using. So also you need to check if it's actually a copy or not. Um, but yeah, it might improve performance with some disadvantages. The nice thing is the, the signature of the function is uh, the same, so you can just replace it um, and you will get an auto primitive array instead of an auto array back, but the rest of the code in our example can stay the same. Let's have a look at the push implementation. We also, we now need to cast the native pointer to a mutual priority queue pointer, which you then can dereference and create a mutable reference out of it. This is an unsafe operation, so we wrap it in an unsafe block. And then we can push the item onto the queue like we would expect. We should also go insert a null check before if the pointer is already invalid. But yeah, for simplicity, I left that out. The pop implementation is also similar. We again convert our pointer to a um, priority queue reference. We again check if it's null before. Um, and this time we have to see if if the queue was already empty. So if we receive a value, we can just return it. Um, and if not, we can throw an exception back to Java. Uh, to do that, first we have to fetch the exception type from the Java, envi uh, Java environment. And then we can call throw new to throw the exception. To satisfy the Rust compiler, we have to return something, but it will won't be consumed on the Java side because um, of the exception before. Yeah, as already mentioned, we need to clean up the memory afterwards. We again need to convert our pointer to a PQ pointer. We should check for now before. Um, and then we, we use box from raw to tell Rust that it should take over control of the memory again. And then we can call the drop function. Um, this is actually not mandatory um, because it will be dropped anyhow when the function goes out of scope. But yeah, it's nice also to call it, to make it clear and call it explicitly. This is also unsafe, so we wrap it again in an unsafe block. The only thing left to do is load our library also um, in, on the Java side. We can create the static initializer for that and call the system load library function with the library name as a parameter. Um, make sure to leave out the extension because the extension can be different on the platform. On Windows it will be a .dll and on Linux it will be a .so. And also we need to declare our create as create type cdlib in our cargo toml to make sure Rust builds a, um, a, a library following um, the C conventions. When we run our program, we also have to pass the, the folder where our library is located as the Java library path parameter. Okay, a couple of caveats when you do uh, use Java with native code. Also consider that, that there is a performance penalty of the JNI interface. So instead of processing only a few elements, it's better to process always many elements for each JNI call. Also, if you would like to turn on the strict provenance feature, which is still um, an experimental feature of, of Rust nightly. Um, the pointer integer casts we did will tell the compiler to opt out of strict provenance. So 
you cannot take the advantages of strict provenance anymore, basically. Um, what is provenance? So provenance is the permission to access an allocation sandbox. It comes with a spatial component um, about which range of memory the pointer is allowed to access and also a temporal component until when the pointer is allowed to access that memory. And this information would get lost in strict provenance. So why would you actually want to use strict provenance? Um, the idea is to allow adoptions of tools like Cherry and Miri that help increasing the safety of unsafe code. So yeah, I just wanted to let you know if you ever think uh, that might be interesting to you, you will have to solve the problem with the pointer integer costs. If you want to find out more, there is a very interesting Twitter thread by Gankra, the unsafe Rust person, and also an interesting article by Ralph Jung about why pointers are complicated. Okay, so let's wrap up what we discussed and what you should remember. So <coughs> for establishing the interface between Java and Rust, on the uh, Java side, you have to declare a method prefixed with native, with the native keyword. On the Rust side, you have to provide a matching uh, function with a matching signature with the help of the JNI and JNI FN crates. If you, it doesn't work and you get an unsatisfied link uh, error on Java, you can check the generated header file if there is something wrong with the function declaration. And if state is a requirement, you can work around uh, with a native pointer casted to a JLong. Um, arrays can be passed with copy, copying or pinning. Pinning is faster, but it might block garbage collection. So if your garbage collector is very busy, it might not be faster in the end. Um, and if you leak memory to Java, you need to make sure to clean it up afterwards. Uh, freeing resources from a finalized method is not guaranteed to work, so it's better to clean up memory explicitly. Also consider the performance penalty of the JNI interface, and as mentioned, pointer integer pointer round trips are, do not satisfy the strict provenance requirements. Um, if you check out the documentation of the JNI um, and JNI FN crates, uh, you find most of the important information there, and it also includes links to the official JNI specification. There are also uh, a few alternatives to JNI. There is also the Java Native Access, which is slower but easier. So if performance is not that important, you can have a look into that. There is also the Java Native Runtime. It has comparable performance, but uh, requires less boilerplate code, less glue code. And there is Project Panama, but apparently it's still experimental. Okay, let's move to the live demo. So we want to compare, um, I've prepared an application where we can compare um, image processing filters between Java and Rust. So let's, let's have a look at our main file. Um, we are basically, we are loading an image. Um, we measure the time and then apply a grayscale filter onto that image. And then we measure the time difference um, and print it out. Then, ah, so, sorry for that. Uh, now it should work. Thanks for just a second. <laughs> T 
the the one thing I didn't test. Okay. Okay. So um, we have a Java class, and in the main function, we basically we load an image, we measure the time before and after, and print out the difference, and then we save the image also. Um, and first, we apply a grayscale filter, uh, converting a color image to grayscale. And then we also um, apply a blur filter and do the same thing. Let me quickly show how it works. So here we, we have some test image. And if we run our application, Okay, so we see it took uh, 20 milliseconds for applying the grayscale filter and 100 milliseconds for the blur filter because it's a little bit more complicated. And we see the newly generated image. So here we have the same image in grayscale and a blurry version. Okay, so let's have a look at the code. <coughs> um, I've quick. I have prepared a grayscale filter interface and there is one implementation in Java and one in Rust. The Java implementation is pretty straightforward. We iterate over each pixel and then we um, combine the color channels to a grayscale color value. A naive approach would be just taking the average um, of all the color values, but um, there is a nicer, if you wait, actually, yeah, people found out um, when they, when they uh, moved from grayscale uh, television to color television, they realized that weighting uh, the color channels differently actually um, creates a nicer, perceptually nicer result. So we also apply those factors to our different color values and then set all the pixels to the same um, grayscale color value. If, if we have a look at uh, uh, yeah, let's have a look at the uh, Rust implementation. On the Java side, we declare this native process blur filter, which receives, uh, sorry, that was the wrong one. Okay, so we have this native process grayscale filter function, which takes the byte array of pixels now let's have a look at the Rust implementation. <coughs> we we use, as before uh, explained, this GNIFN function to make sure we get the matching uh, signature. Um, then we fetch the Java byte array with get primitive array critical. And afterwards, um, I have a helper function which turns this Java byte array into a slice of pixels. Now let's have a look at this convert uh, to grayscale. The code looks pretty similar. We again iterate over each pixel and then use the weights to compute our gray color value. So now let's have a look at our main fun function again. <sighs> we 
Let's replace now this Java Grayscale filter with the Rust Grayscale filter. And run the application again. So before it took 18 milliseconds, and now doing it in Java, it should be faster. And it only takes eight milliseconds, so it's half of the time, basically. Let's have a look at the other example. So we also have this blur filter. A blur filter basically works by looking at the neighbors. Um, you basically, you, you have a, a window of nine by nine, so eight neighbors. Um, and you compute the average out of them. This is a box blur filter, which, which takes the average of the three by three neighborhood. Uh, there would be also a Gaussian blur filter, which is sometimes uh, better, uh, which weights the neighbors differently. Um, but for simplicity, we use this uh, box blur filter. L let's have a look at the Java implementation. It looks quite ugly uh, because we are um, accessing a one-dimensional array and we are computing the new indexes but basically what you should uh, know is first we um, iterate over the x and y coordinates of the destination image and then we iterate over each color channel and then we iterate over the three by three indices of the of our window we compute the sum of all those um, color values, uh, pixel value, yeah, color values. And then we divide this sum, we divide it through nine, so, to, so we get the average and store it um, at the destination index. So let's move on to the Rust implementation. We again declare it um, the native function. This time we we um, pass a reference to the pixels and the results uh, to the to the input array and to the output array separately, because we we need to look. We are updating pixels and we need to look to neighbors which we might have already updated before. Um, so if we separate the memory, we don't run, in, in, run into any issues. And we also need to know the dimensions of the image. Now let's switch to the Rust side. So here we have the process blur filter. <coughs> Fetching the pixels is quite similar. We also, yeah, this time we also need to fetch uh, a ref uh, the reference to the source uh, and to the result array. Um, and then we call this blur function. If we use this image buffer types, we can, it, it makes it quite easy to iterate over um, the, over uh, the x and y coordinates. So it looks a little bit nicer than our Java implementation. Maybe there would have been something similar on the Java side as well, but I didn't want to skew the performance result um, because yeah, if you use a library, you don't know um, if it adds some additional performance penalty. Um, but yeah, it's basically the same. We iterate over the source uh, pixels and all the color channels, and then we iterate over the window, uh, the three by three window, create the sum and divide the sum um, by nine. Uh, ah, yeah, that's here basically. And then we store it at the index of our destination image. Now let's try this one as well. Going back to our main function, 
Let's also replace the blur filter with the rust blur filter. And run it again. So before it took 85 milliseconds, and now it only takes 33. It's actually not a very uh, scientific performance test. Uh, we probably would have, we would need to run it multiple times to make sure that not any cache, um, yeah, to warm up the caches and so on. So I've seen even like a 10 times uh, performance improvement. Um, not sure if I run it again, it will be faster maybe. But yeah, um, on the Rust side, is, it's of course faster. Um, yeah, we we have the links here to to our example repos and also the repository of this um, image processing demo. If you want to look it up, um, are there any questions? Yes, thank you very much, Harald and Fred. And okay. So um, great, thank you. Um, my I I maintain twenty five year old C code, which has got a lovely tree of make files and several hundred well engineered unit tests. And um, yeah, so tell me about cargo versus make files and cargo versus um, Eclipse Maven, because that's where I'm really running into difficulty. Is not how do I interface my code, but how do I convince all the other developers that I'm not about to screw them over by breaking the whole build? Um, I mean, okay, I, th th there are so many things to talk about, so I'll just pick a few. Um, so, make is available probably in places where cargo isn't, so it depends on what you're doing. Um, but you can use Cargo to, you can port your Make-based C project to Cargo without using Rust at all, except for the build script. So you can use something like the CC crate, which CXX, the, ex the CXX example I showed, so the CXX build script I showed actually um, uses the CC crate to do that, to like call the compiler. But then there is a lot of stuff that you have to probably re-implement uh, that make does for you uh, for free, kind of. Yeah, I think that we can talk more about that. This is interesting. So like, let's talk about it after in more detail. Uh, yeah, but there's, there's a nugget there. <laughs> For, for the Java side, um, how do you ship the software? How that uh, impact you? Like, for example, yeah, same kind of concept. Like, how do you ship the DLL or, you know, dot, dot? So, uh, do you bundle it in the jar or outside? And I guess you have to do also different release for different architectures. Do you? Um, yeah, exactly. You basically, so you, you, you need to store the libraries in there. Um, and because of the extension, you can store in the same directory the, Java, uh, the, the Linux and the, the Windows version, for example, and it will pick up the right one because of the extension. And you have to make sure that this um, native, uh, the, the directory, that the JVM knows the directory where your DLLs are located. So depending on which kind you use for Gradle, there is a parameter also to define this, but yeah, you need to make sure that this minus D parameter Java build, uh, Java, yeah, I think it was built path, um, 
library path, um, yeah, it needs to be passed when calling the Java application. But yeah. Um, I think you can even have it in, in, the, in the char file. I would have to look up how to do this then with the Java library path. Hi, uh, thank you for the great presentation. We saw that for GNI, there is some performance penalty when calling uh, from Java to Rust. I wanted to know if there is a similar performance penalty when calling, when calling Rust from C or C++, and if the binary size uh, increases. Um, about binary size, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't think there is a reason why it should. Um, and in terms of a performance cost, um, it depends. So uh, for all the basic types, there should be no performance cost. Um, but for strings, you either need to check the string invariance on the Rust side, which incurs a performance cost, or always assume that the person writing C and is calling your Rust function is doing it right or is making sure that everything is correct before they make the call. So it depends on the trade-off that you want to do, uh, that you want to have. Yeah. Um, I think maybe something to add. Um, the reason for the performance penalties on Java is that the JVM is doing some uh, optimizations at runtime. And if there is GNI code, it cannot do certain optimizations. And yeah, also with um, handling the garbage collector. So maybe that's not the case for if you use C or C++. I mean, uh, the Rust compiler is not going to optimize your C code or something like that. Right? No, the, those are totally separate things. <laughs> ah, thank you. Um, in C and C++, you have the possibility to use uh, tools ra like Valgrind or use sanitizers to test uh, if your uh, connection have some kind of uh, undefined behavior. Can you do the same for Java with the same tools or other tools? I, I didn't try. Um, I th it's probably a bit more complicated, but I would have to guess if it's, I don't know if it's actually possible. Uh, in that case, it could be maybe possible to fuzz the Rust implementation just uh, like it was a, just a C library. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah. Uh, yeah, also a C question. So I'm, I'm working on a, a, a little library that I want to expose to C. So implementation is in Rust. And I was hoping um, through, well, working with manual pointers in the, the signatures that I could just run a Rust doc and give this documentation to the C developers. And then I wouldn't really have to write my C documentation, but you're talking about using an option of a box and these kind of constructions. And I don't think my C developers will like to see that in the documentation. Is there a, an, 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 an interesting point that you can make there? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have anything to add, but um, make your trade-off. And uh, maybe, I, I don't know for sure, but that's an idea, if cargo doc could rename types. So you could then, uh, yeah, that, that might be a good idea for that. So, thank you. I think we have a last question. First of all, thanks for the presentation. Actually, I have a comment and a question on the Java one. So I would say if you're looking for this kind of interop in the Java world, uh, having a look at the Project Panama is definitely uh, worthwhile because it's currently in final preview and it's probably going to be stable in 20, Java, Java 20. And with regards to JNI, it provides a really rich API to OFIP uh, access. It also comes with performance improvement because it allows you to have uh, just-in-time compilations. And also it really removes the lifting which is required by classic JNI approaches. So you don't have to load libraries uh, at all. You, as a Java developer, you just use a native library as if it's Java. That's it. 
because it comes with a J extract tool, which is part of Panova, which is really uh, nice. And I have a question. Uh, I'm not really sure if uh, if possible, but in theory, uh, Graal VM comes with the Truffle API, which promises uh, interoperability with code that gets compiled to LLVM. So I, my question would be, have you experimented with that? Because I, I didn't, so I, I'm just, I would be just curious about it. Thanks, thanks for your comment. Um, I didn't play around with Graal VM yet. Maybe uh, Fred has a little bit of experience. Did you ever use it with, with Rust code as well? I mean, I know Sulong supports uh, Rust, um, but that's about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I did work on Sulong, but uh, I, I mean, we primarily focused on C and C++. So. So, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Farrell. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> <laughs>